morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you please to turn to Acts in the 28th chapter. Acts chapter 28. I titled the message, Unexpected. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. In the pew in front of you, you'll find a Bible. I encourage you to grab that Bible. And the Bible in the pew will be on page 1,330. Page 1,330. So you can all follow along in the Bible this morning. If you don't own a Bible or need a Bible, then I encourage you to take that Bible from the pew as our gift to you. I want everyone to have access to a Bible. So you can take it home with you and look at any questions you ask me about that. But I'm glad you're here. We would like everyone to open up a Bible, whether on your phone, physically, or use that one in the pew, as we look at the next part of the story in the life of the Apostle Paul. And I imagine that this title, Unexpected, could be applied to many different circumstances and situations in Paul's life. Many times when he was anticipating a certain set of uh, uh, circumstances and a situation, that God would do something unexpected to Paul. And I find in my life that God often does the unexpected as well. Anyone else relate with that with me? That we have our own plans, our own ideas, our own contingencies, and God sees fit to change them. Yes or no? Shake them around this morning. Let me know you're awake. Let me know if you can relate to, to this concept. How do you respond when God disrupts your life? Now, answer that inside, please, not outwardly. Because if we had to pull the audience, if we had to be honest and transparent, we could not answer that we always handle those disruptions well. Maybe we start well, and we intend well, but we don't end well. At some point in our flesh, when we're not having our eyes on Jesus Christ, We become discouraged. We become discontent. We complain. We criticize, and and we, we have put up with so much. This was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Unexpected. How do we handle life's unexpected disruptions? Most of us plan excessively using maps or electronic devices when we travel, calendars and schedules on a daily basis, lists to do, reading books, helping us accomplish more with less, whether it is in a project uh, around the house or finances, trying to get more done in the day and waste less time. But sometimes, sometimes life takes an unexpected turn, and it's nothing short than the hand of God in our life. Some have pointed us to the thought that these are divine appointments, and that's a great thought. Divine interactions from God, but if we're honest, we don't always think that a flat tire or a bad diagnosis or an unexpected interruption or an unplanned for bill is a divine appointment. Sometimes we want to blame a life, blame circumstances, or blame people. How do we handle disruptions. Everything that occurs in this life is either planned for or permitted by God. Nothing happens by coincidence. You didn't just get yourself here. God either planned it or permitted it or allowed it. Nothing in life happens outside of the scope of God's hand, whether by plan or by permitting. And how we respond when our expectations, when our plans, when our contingencies, how we respond when they're unrealized or unmet reveals a lot about how we view God's hand on our life. In Acts chapter 28, these first eight verses, we're going to see in the life of the Apostle Paul yet another unexpected disruption in his life. We're going to see what God does, and then with his help and grace from the Scripture, gather some truths that I believe will help you and I in life when God allows a disruption to enter. Let's go Lord in prayer before we look at Scripture. Lord, we love you this morning. I pray that you'd help these next few moments to be a time that glorifies you. 
And Lord, help me as the speaker this morning to say those things that would be in line with your word, that would uh, give the glory completely and totally to you. And Lord, I pray that you would keep the distractions free from this service, from this time, that nothing would be in place that would hinder your word from touching hearts. And Lord, I pray that our, our minds and hearts and, and thoughts would be open to this concept of disruptions and, and what we can do with your word and your, and your way. And Lord, speak to us this morning. Lord, I ask, that I've already prayed this morning, there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, that, that today that they will look to you and receive you and ask you for eternal life, knowing that you will freely grant it, offer it, and give it to them. Lord, we we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 20, if your Bibles are open, and we will read these first eight verses where we pick up in the, in the account the ship that Paul has been on was rammed into a sandbar. On this particular sandbar, this is the end of Acts chapter 27, the Bible tells us that there's some forces of waves at the sandbar. And the ship that Paul and the other 275 others were on has been utterly and totally destroyed. God promised that every soul on that vessel, all 276, would reach land safely. And last Sunday we, we noticed how some had to swim, some got a big old board, and some got a small broken piece of the ship. But God honored his word like he always does, and everyone came to dry land, safe and sound. Though they didn't all get there the same way or at the same time, God still honored his promise like he always does. That's where we pick up where now they're wet, they're battered, they've been beaten from the, from the ship and from the travel over, some having swam a large, a large way, some floating apparently the whole way, and some hanging on for dear life. Here we pick up in Acts chapter 28, verse number 1, where the Bible says this, and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous, for, means foreigners, people they didn't know, the people showed us no little, no small kindness, for they kindled a fire. And they received and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. Now we'll pause a few times. Let's pause right there. This is a wonderful thing. They've made it to shore, and, and they're wet. No matter if you floated or swam, they're, they're drenched. They've been in this storm for, for a while, longer than the 14 days they had not eaten, but longer than that. And, and man, it's just, they, they beat up mentally, emotionally, physically. And they come to this island. Who knows what they would encounter at the island? When they read that word barbarous, at first you think, you think cannibals, right? And wouldn't that be a turn for the worst? Like, now we're saved only to get eaten alive. That's not what happened here. These people received them with kindness, and they, they made a fire for, and to, to kind of dry them out and get them warm again. I mean, and, and you could almost say that finally, something is starting to go right for the Apostle Paul. After all this trouble, finally something, all right, there's a little bit of goodness in his life at this point. There's, there's some people receiving him who are not trying to kill him like previous people have received him. They're not trying to accuse him. They're not locking him up. They're building a fire, and they're, and they're treating them well, and they're trying to get them dried out and warmed up and encouraged. Here they are, being encouraged, being warmed up, having some relief finally on dry land, safe and sound. And then the unexpected. Verse number three. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks... And laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now we will get there in just a minute, but just, just put this thought in your, mo your mind. Unexpected. Unexpected. How many men and women have ever carried some sticks? Come on, you picked them up in the yard. Come on, ever carried a stick? How many have ever thrown a stick on a fire? How many have ever had a viper jump out of the fire and latch onto your hand? This is not planned for. Not planned for. Let's continue. We'll come back there. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. 
They shook off the beast in the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. It came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. What happens when life brings the unexpected? Now, I would submit that there are three unexpected situations inside of the story with three different truths that we can learn and absolutely apply in our life. I believe the first unexpected is the unexpected blessing found in the first few verses of fire, of warmth, of a kind reception. If you know the story of Paul, and many have been with us over the weeks, and you, you will remember this, those who are here will, will, will learn that Paul is one of many prisoners accompanied by Roman soldiers. He has been in shackles and bondage. He is a prisoner. He is headed toward Rome to stand before Caesar Augustus. Life has not been good in that sense. There have not been a lot of comforts for Paul. Beyond that, like we mentioned before, there's been a huge storm. And so to be shipwrecked on an island that is now filled with people who don't desire to eat you but to help you, this is unexpected. Are you with me so far? The Bible says that these foreign people, these barbarous and barbarians, the Bible words, use them here in our our scripture, receive them with not just a little kindness, but it implies much kindness. This is unexpected. Unexpected blessings in life. You ever receive unexpected blessings? Shake them or rattle them, yes or no? Why is it we're quicker to identify unexpected problems, unexpected blessings seem to fade away in our mind? Anybody else guilty of that thought process? Absolutely. I would encourage us, first of all, to remember this, to learn this, to rejoice in what God plans. When this ship was wrecked, did God know where it was going to shipwreck? Yes or no? Did God know the exact piece of sand and the exact place in the ocean that this ship would become destroyed? Yes or no? Did God know the land that would be close? Yes or no? Did God know the people on that island? Yes or no? So did God plan for this interaction for the Apostle Paul and those other 275 people on that vessel? Yes or no? Rejoice in what God plans. Rejoice in what God plans. I don't see Paul sitting here saying, you know what? It's about time. Do you see that? Where Paul says, boy, it's about time. I've been pretty faithful to God. I've given a lot of years of my life to God. I've, I've taken a lot of hits for God. It's about time I get a fire to warm me up. I was the only one on that boat who stood for God. Everyone else ignored God, and and they were discouraged, but I wasn't. It's about time God rewarded my faithfulness. Do you see Paul doing that? But that hits our minds. That hits our thoughts. Accept, or I'm sorry, rejoice in what God plans. Now, the Bible says that Paul ended up on a little island, and the Bible says it's Melita. It's a transliteration from the Greek word. We don't really know what island Paul landed on. There are two islands in the general vicinity, and based upon weather patterns, he either crashed in a place called Malta, or Millet is the other place. They're farther apart. Now, they have studied this, and I, and I did a whole, I was studying for this sermon, I did a whole deep dive into what island Paul ended up on. A couple of cool things at the end we'll get to in a moment. One thing I looked at is which one had poisonous snakes, right? Because Paul got bitten by a poisonous snake. We'll get there in a minute. It doesn't really matter what island Paul was on. What matters is this. The island that Paul was on was exactly the island that Paul was supposed to be on. It was no accident where Paul was at. So can we learn this? Can we learn 
to be content where God puts us. Can we learn that? Can we, can we just get that for a day? Can we just learn to be content where God puts us? Maybe we didn't get there like we wanted to get there. I don't think a shipwreck was the way that Paul thought he'd show up on this island. But can we learn to be content where God has put us? My friends, when life allows, when God allows and permits or plans the unexpected, learn to be content where God has put you. Lord, I don't like this job right now. Learn to be content where God has put you. Lord, I don't like the vehicle I'm driving right now. Learn to be content where God has put you. Lord, I don't like this hard conflict that I'm in right now. Learn to be content where God has placed you. When life is disrupted, we ought to learn contentment. Paul says this later on to his son in the faith, Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I think Paul could weigh in on the contentment conversation better than a lot of us. Paul in that passage, another passage says this, I've learned to abound, that means have a lot, and I've learned to be a base, that's have nothing. But I've learned, he said, in whatsoever state I am and therewith to be content. My friends, this morning you and I could have a good dose, a good helping of contentment in our lives. You know that we are under a constant barrage to be discontent. This is the purpose of advertisements and commercials and our society. That what you have is now not good enough. The vehicle that you bought last week, it will not fly. Time to buy a new one. It will not drive itself, all of itself, just part of itself. Time to buy a new one. The shoes that you purchased, last year's model, they don't jump nearly as high as this year's model. So buy a new pair. The house you lived in, the house you lived in and, and, and enjoying life in, it's not big enough. It's not new enough. It's not nice enough. We're under a constant barrage to be discontent. But my friends, if we're going to handle life with God's grace and his help and please the Lord, we must learn that the place I'm at, the situation I'm in, that God has permitted or planned, is just where I'm supposed to be. And I can be content. When there's blessings, I'm content. You see, my faith shouldn't be swayed by my circumstances. But my circumstances should always be swayed by my faith. So here Paul is. He's at an island. He's sitting by the fire. And he's helping build the fire. Did you catch that in the story? That Paul wasn't there just to be served. Paul was there to serve. And the place that God put him, Paul was still a servant. He grabbed some sticks to help build the fire for everyone else. Was Paul cold? No doubt. Was Paul, was Paul tired? Absolutely. Was he weary and emotionally worn out and physically worn out from getting from the ship to the land? No doubt. And yet Paul grabbed some sticks to be a servant. And that's when the viper bites. Look, please. Verse number three, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. This story has always intrigued me. One, because I love snakes. Now, some of you think I'm nuts. It's just, just the way I am. I did a, a science fair project, Mrs. Dalton, on snakes when I was in high school. I loved them. I, had a, uh, I used a ball python a few years back for a patch play. It was, we did a patch, the pirate play that had live snakes in it, or snakes in it, and I had two six-foot snakes coming unbeknownst to the cast and crew. Uh, I didn't tell, I, I, I don't know if I told anybody, but I had two snakes at the cage here. I'd called a, 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 a reptile man that I knew in town. He said, I'll bring two over for you, J.D. He goes, they're a little bit, they're a little bit cantanker, cantankerous. I said, well, I'm not telling anybody. I said, it'll be the greatest surprise when, when my young people actually walk into this, to this teepee and they think they're snakes and they're actually real snakes there, all right, because they think there's going to be fake snakes. Well, at the last minute, uh, they were biting each other. They were very vicious. He said, I'm gonna, I, I can't bring them today. And I was so disappointed. They didn't know I was so disappointed. But I, I love snakes. But I don't love snakes like this. 
So here Paul is, he's serving God. He's helping others. He's helping others, and a viper jumps out of the fire and bites his hand. Can I give you the reaction that most of us have if this were to happen? It'd be like this. Really, Lord? That's the reaction most of us would have. Really, Lord, a viper? Like, I can survive a storm where you can't see the sun, moon, and stars. People don't eat for 14 days. I can, I can handle bondage. I can handle prison. I can handle uh, people trying to kill me and making death threats against me. And then you have a stinking snake jump out of fire while I'm serving others, bite my hand? Really? That's how most of us respond, isn't it? And most of you are like a snake? What do you do in the unexpected after you survive the attack, survive the imprisonment, survive the storm, survive the shipwreck, and then a, bite, and then a viper bites you? Interesting enough, I found this because I know about snakes. Snakes lie dormant in the cold, right? Because they're, they're cold blood reptiles. And then upon a source of heat, then they'll become active again. So in essence, when things were about to become good, that's when the snake jumped out of bed. Now, I'm not trying to draw a crazy correlation, but it seems like in our life that when things are about to go well, that's when the snake comes out and bites. And we sit there thinking, life unexpected disruptions. Can't I catch a break? Can't I catch a break? We sit there, Lord, just one time, right, just one time in my life, can I catch a break? Not realizing that God had already preserved our life multiple times. He saved us. His hand was upon us, guiding us before the shipwreck, before the salvation on the island, before the fire. Way back when, when Saul was young, sitting at the feet of a teacher, God's hand was upon him, preparing him for a mission. When Saul was on his own mission and God brought a great light and struck him down, God's hand was upon him, saving him, bringing salvation. When Paul was blind to begin his, his missionary, his tenure, God's hand was upon him, taking him to the right place with Barnabas. When others rejected him and others, and, and others brought comfort, God's hand was upon him. And the snake bite is exactly what God permitted and planned in Paul's life. What happens when you get by a snake? Notice the scripture, because this is, this is absolutely human nature. Verse number four. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. You know what happens when somebody sees you get bit by a snake? They notice and they accuse. I knew you were a fake. That's the only reason you got a bad thing in your life. I knew you were a problem. Because everyone knows Bad things only happen to bad people. Everyone knows that. They said, he's a murderer. Ha <laughs> ha. You see, the people on this island, the historians tell us, believed in this god. The god's name was either, it's either called Dice or Dyke. It was a god of justice. And the god of justice always got the man. And so you could run, but you couldn't hide in what they were implying then vengeance. They're like, aha, Paul escaped, but you can never escape justice. And their false god of justice was taking their vengeance on Paul. And now they're watching. Paul's going to swell up. I did the deep dive on what snakes would have been over there. There's a, there's a Mediterranean viper that causes swelling that perhaps this, this could be. Swelling, and then you'll fall over dead. And they're waiting for Paul to swell up and drop dead, and he doesn't. And so, like a human reaction, they go from, you're a murderer, all right, you're the lowest of the lowest, to now you're a god. They skipped a whole lot of things in between, right? You're the worst of the worst, or you're deity. All right, and Paul is not deity. He works for deity. What happens when the serpent bites? You see, God used this 
to tear down their false religion. God used this viper to accomplish something greater than Paul could have ever accomplished. God used this venomous snake at this moment to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. Now, there's a little truth in here that I I don't want you to miss. I think it's kind of helpful. Notice, notice in verse number five, what did he do to the snake? You can just write this down. This is a side note in the sermon. When you're bit by the snake, you know what you ought to do? Shake it off. That can be a whole sermon, just so you know. Shake it off. Paul didn't panic and freak out. Paul didn't run around saying, woe is me. Oh, my life is over. Oh, oh, why me? Paul's not posting on Facebook. Paul's not crying to his friends. Paul's not writhing on the ground. Paul's not crying. He's not, you know what he does? He shakes it off. That's right. That'll preach. I'm telling you right now, shake it off. You know why? Because Paul knew something that we need to learn. Not only must we rejoice in what God has planned, but we must accept what God permits. You know what, Lord? If it's a snake bite that sends me to heaven, so be it. Shake it off. Shake it off. But you have to remember this. God had already told Paul he's not dying. God had told Paul, you're going to Rome. Paul, you're going to stand before Caesar. So you know what? Paul could have said this, bring the snakes on. I'm snake proof. I'm filled with anti-venom. I'm bulletproof because God has made me some promises so I can shake it off. You know, my friend, God has made you some promises in life. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. You can cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You don't have to worry about it. Shake it off. There were two businessmen talking, both high-powered businessmen, and one said to the other, listen, I live life stress-free, worry-free, anxiety-free. His buddy said, how do you do that? He said, I've hired someone to worry for me. He said, really, how does that work? His buddy said, listen, every time a problem comes, I call my worrier, and I give him my problem. I tell him about my problems at work, my problems at home, my problem with my kids. He worries all the time. I don't worry about it. His buddy said, how much did that cost? He said, it cost me 100 grand a month. He said, how do you afford that? He goes, I don't worry about it. And my friends, the Bible promises us someone who will take our worries for us. And he's free. His name is Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So when the snake's hanging on your hand, shake it off. And just accept what God permits. But my friends, the story's not over. Because it wasn't just about a shipwreck, and it wasn't just about a viper. It was about something else. If you would look quickly this morning, the last part, beginning in verse number 6. How be it? They looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever, and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. I did not read originally, but I'd like you to look in verses 9 and 10 now of our passage. What happens next? So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we were departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. The Bible gives just a very brief close to this portion of Paul's unexpected in this journey. And it says that after Paul shook off the viper, that he went to the the chief of the island, the governor of the island, whose name was Publius, 
And his father was sick, and Paul went in there and, and healed him. Now, this is not Paul's first healings. In fact, earlier in Acts, uh, Paul had healed many, and, and Paul was gifted supernaturally to heal. In fact, that people would bring to Paul even the napkins, pieces of clothing from someone, and Paul would bless that and heal that, and they'd be healed. God had used Paul's in, Paul in miraculous ways. And of the, all the healings in the Bible that we're aware of, this is, right here, the very last set of healings that we have any more record of in Scripture. Now, more could have taken place. This is the last time of healing miracles that we have right here in Acts chapter 28. On an island, following a viper bite and a shipwreck. And the Bible finishes the story saying that more came or healed, and then when they left, they honored them and brought them all things necessary. Or in essence, they did not honor them in that way, but, but the scholars and the historians, those in that time, said that this island was so touched by the ministry of God through the Apostle Paul that this island was touched by the gospel. In fact, if you were to follow the life of this man, and this is just from history, you would find out that he, number one, was an important Christian figure. We know this because if there are names mentioned in Acts, we know that they are noticeably known in the early church. So others in the early church knew who Publius was. Why? Not because of his island governorship, but because of his testimony for Jesus Christ. He has been called the first bishop of Malta. And I don't know if Malta was the island that Paul landed on, but I do know this, that Malta has been called the very first Christian nation. The very first Christian nation, they say, is this island of Malta. They say that Malta and the Maltese islands around it, there are 365 different churches, one for every day of the year. Yet, it's small in New York City. You see, the third thought this morning is this, when life is unexpected. Not only must we rejoice in what God plans and accept what God permits, but we must be thankful for God's master plan. My friend, God is doing something bigger than you and I can possibly imagine. And if God had said to Paul, Paul, I'm going to send you to an island, and you're going to be bit by a snake, but then you're going to have a chance to see an entire nation and other nations touch with the gospel, would Paul have gone? Absolutely. You know he would have. We see his willingness throughout Scripture. And I have no doubt that if God made the same request to you that most of us, if not all of us, would say, yes, Lord. But you see, God doesn't always give us the end at the beginning. God doesn't always give us the whole story, day number one. And so we must be thankful that God has a master plan. What if Paul had been complaining? Would that have affected his impact? I believe so. How many times have you and I affected the impact that God wanted us to have because of a bitter, complaining spirit. Be thankful for God's master plan. What if Paul had panicked and tried to solve it all by himself? Would it have affected the impact for God? Absolutely. How many times have we affected God's master plan because we panic? We panic. Instead of just shaking it off. If Paul had just quit... If Paul had just flat out said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. My friends, there are people who quit. They quit on church. They quit on their marriage. Sometimes they even quit on life. It's a real thing. In fact, God's master plan? Yeah, it can. Would he have affected if Paul had quit? Yeah. Don't quit. You see, we must be thankful for God's master plan. I read a little story as we close this morning about Corey Tin Boom. Corey Tin Boom wrote, authored, and spoke. She lived through the time of the Nazi regime and was a Jew and spent years in concentration camps. She's a story of forgiveness, of hope. There's a little story in the midst of that where she's with her sister Betsy in the midst of a concentration camp. 
and they're at Ravensbrook. One day they're there, and in their particular girl dormitory, their girl barracks, they get fleas. Annoying, frustrating, irritating fleas. Kind of like a snake bite. I can imagine that Corey Tin Boom, after all she had faced, separation from her home, her family, seeing death on a regular basis, could have been tempted to complain, to not rejoice in God's plan, appreciate what God has permitted, and not be thankful for God's master plan. But instead, as the story goes, her sister began to thank God for the fleas. Seems unnatural, doesn't it? Seems supernatural. Betsy began to thank God for the, for the fleas, and Corey writes, she said, I couldn't understand why I should thank God for horrible fleas. But she said, I followed Betsy's lead and the Bible's instruction to in everything, give thanks. That's the Bible says. She said it wasn't right away, but it was a while after that she realized something. She realized because of the fleas, the guards left their barracks alone. Because of the fleas, they didn't come in. They weren't assaulted. They weren't touched or tortured. And in fact, beyond that, they were free because the guards were coming in to have as many Bible studies as they, pro as they wanted to. And she said that many of the women came to know Christ because of the fleas. So my friends, I don't know if it'll be a viper in your life. I don't know if it'll be a flea in your life. I don't know what it will be. But I do know this, that when God allows when God plans the unexpected, I hope we remember to, number one, rejoice in what God plans. Be content. To accept what God permits and be thankful for God's master plan. It's not normal. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And today, if God puts f fleas in your life, you say thank you. There's a viper hanging on your hand. Thank you. Because God's doing something bigger than we can possibly imagine.